brought to you by bunnyslippers.com. Check out their brand new Dino Sound Slippers. Slippers make a roaring sound every three steps. Made with green scaly fabric, soft plush uppers, foam footbeds, non-slip grips on soles, and three white claws on each foot. One size fits most up to women's ten and a half, men's nine. Footbed measures ten and a half. Black Clock Audio Tales is a daily podcast that reads you a story, either a chapter of a novel or a whole short story. Join us in our exploration of old ghost stories, supernatural fiction, horror tales, folk tales, fantasy, gothic horror, weird fiction, and cosmic horror. And don't forget to join us for our monthly show about the Cthulhu Mythos. Look for our podcast near the old wishing well in the Blasted Heath, wherever you find your podcast. We suggest Podbean or Apple Podcasts. Find us on the web at pgttcm.com and at Black Clock Audio on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, and Black Clock Audio Tales on YouTube. Welcome to Black Clock Audio Tales. Check out our new website over at www.pgttcm.com. Edited by Daniel Spitzer. Music by Kevin McLeod. The Chamber, A Price of Gloom, Despair. Welcome to Part 1, Folklore of Great Britain. Join us at the end of the month when we talk about the Great Old Ones. Chapter 14 of Welsh Fairy Tales Recording by Betty B. Welsh Fairy Tales by William Elliot Griffiths Chapter 14 The Welshery and the Normans Though their land has been many times invaded, the Welsh have never been conquered. Powerful tribes like the Romans, Saxons, and Normans have tried to overwhelm them. Even when English and German kings attempted to crush their spirit and blot out their language and literature, the Welsh resisted and won victory. Among the bullies that tried force instead of justice and played the slave driver rather than the good Samaritan's way were the Normans. These brutal fellows, when they thought they had overrun Wales with their armies, began to build strong castles all over the country. They kept armed men by the thousands ready, night and day, to rush out and put to death anybody and everybody who had a weapon in his hand. Often they burned whole villages. They killed so many Welsh people that it seemed at times as if they expected to empty the land of its inhabitants. Thus they hoped to possess all the acres for themselves. They talked as if there were no people so refined and so cultured as they were, while the natives, good and bad, were lumped together as the Welshery. Yet all this time, with these hundreds of strong castles, bristling with turrets and towers, no Englishman's life was safe. If he dared to go out alone, even twenty rods from the castle, he was instantly killed by some angry Welshman lying in ambush. So the Normans had to lock themselves up in armor until they looked like lobsters in their shells. When on their ironclad horses, they resembled turtles, so that if a knight fell off, he had to be chopped open to be rid of his metal clothes. Yet all this was in vain, for when the Norman marched out in bodies or rode in squadrons, the Welshery kept away and were hidden. Even the birds and beasts noticed this, and saw what fools the Normans were to behave so brutally. As for the fairies, they met together to see what could be done. Even the reptiles shamed men by living together more peaceably. Only the beasts of prey approved of the Norman way of treating the Welsh people. At last it came to pass that after the long War of the Roses, when the Reds and the Whites had fought together, a Welsh king sat upon the throne of England. Henry the Eighth was of Cymric ancestry. His full name was Henry Tudor, or in English, Henry Theodore. Among the Welsh, every son to his own name as a child, such as Henry, William, Thomas, etc., added that of his father. Thus it happens that we can usually tell a man by his name, for example, Richards, Roberts, Evans, Jones, etc., etc., that he is a Welshman. When a Welshman went into England to live, if he were a sister's son, he usually added a syllable showing this, as in the case of Jefferson, which means sister's son. Our great Thomas Jefferson used to boast that he could talk Welsh. 
so the living creatures of all sorts in wales human beings fairies and animals took heart and plucked up courage when a tudor king henry the eighth sat on the throne now it was puck who led the fairies as the great peacemaker he went first to visit all the most ancient creatures in order to find out who should be offered the post of honor as ambassador who should be sent to the great king in london henry tudor to see what could be done for wales first he called on the male eagle oldest of all birds though not bald-headed like his american cousin the welsh eagle was very old and at that time a widower although he had been father to nine generations of eaglets he sent puck to the stag this splendid creature with magnificent antlers lived at the edge of the forest near the trunk of an oak tree it was still standing but was now a mere shell old men said that the children of the aborigines played under it and here was the home of the god of lightning which they worshipped so to the withered oak puck went and offered him the honor of leadership to an embassy to the king but the stag answered and said well do i remember when an acorn fell from the top of the parent oak then for three hundred years it was growing children played under it they gathered acorns in their aprons and the archers made bows from its boughs then the oak tree began to die and during nearly thirty tens of years it has been fading and i have seen it all yet there is one older than i it is the salmon that swims in the lynn stream inquire there so of the old mother salmon puck went to ask and this was the answer which he received count all the spots on my body and all the eggs in my row one for each year yet the blackbird is older even than i go listen to her story she excels me in both talk and fact and the blackbird opened its orange-colored bill and answered proudly do you see this flinty rock on which i am sitting once it was so huge that three hundred yoke of oxen could hardly move it yet today it hardly more than affords me room to roost on what made it so small do you ask well all i have clone to wear it away has been to wipe my beak on it every night before i go to sleep and in the morning to brush it with the tips of my wing even puck fairy though he was was astonished at this but the blackbird added go to the toad that blinks its eye under the big rock yonder his age is greater than mine the toad was half asleep when puck came but it opened with alertness its beautiful round bright eyes set in a rim of gold then puck asked the question o thou that carriest a jewel in thy head are there any things alive that are older than thou art that i could not be sure of especially if as many false things are told about them as are told about me but when i was a tadpole in the pond that old hag of an owl was still hooting away in the treetops scaring children as in ages gone she is older than i go and see her if age makes wise she is the wisest of all puck went into the forest but at first saw no bird answering to the description given him he said to himself she is i wonder who he was surprised to hear his question repeated not as an echo but by another still he thought it might possibly be his own voice come back so in making a catalogue in his notebook of what he had seen and heard that day he put down to wit one echo again came the sound to wit to who to wit to who sounded the voice thinking that this was intended to be a polite question puck looked up sure enough there was the wise bird sitting on a bough above him as sober as a judge who did you ask answered puck and then went on to explain i am lord of the fairies in welshery and i seek to know which is the most venerable of all the creatures in the land of the red dragon i am ready to salute you as the most ancient and honorable of all living things in the cumric realm you are desired to bear a message to the great king in london tickled by such delicate flattery and the honors proffered her this lady owl 
after much blinking and winking flirting and fluttering at last agreed to go to king henry the eighth in london the business with which she was charged was to protest against norman brutality and to plead for justice now this old lady owl gray with centuries though she had such short ears kept them open by day and during the night also for all the gossip that floated in the air she knew all about everybody and everything from what she had heard she expected to find the new king henry the eighth a royal fellow in velvet with a crown on his head and his body as big and round as a hogshead sitting in a room full of chopping blocks and battle axes further she fancied she would find a dozen pretty women locked up in his palace some in the cellar others in the pantry and more in the garret but all waiting to have their heads chopped off for the popular story ran that his chief amusement was to marry a wife one day and slice off her head the next it was also said that the king kept a private graveyard and took a walk in it every afternoon to study the epitaphs which he kept a scholar busy in writing and also a man from the marble yard near by to chisel them on the tombs after his various wives had been properly beheaded but the owl never could find out whether these fables were wicked fibs or fairy tales or only street talk puck and the owl together arrived in london at the palace when the king was at his dinner the butlers and lackeys wanted to keep them out but the merry monarch gave orders to let them in at once he made the owl perch over the mantelpiece but told puck to stand upon the dinner table and walk over the tablecloth the pepper box was put away so that he should not sneeze and the king carefully removed the mustard pot for fear the little fairy fellow might fall in it and be drowned in the hot stuff his majesty said that for the time being puck should be the prince of wales puck strutted about to the amusement of the king and all the court ladies but he kept away from the pepper which made his nose tingle and from the hot soup for fear he might tumble into it and be scalded when the dessert came on puck hid himself under a walnut shell just for fun it would take too long to tell about all that was said or the questions which the king asked about his welsh subjects and which either the owl or the ferryman answered according to puck's story wales was then a most distressful country though the welshery to a man wanted to be good and loyal subjects of the tudors several times did puck appeal to the owl to have his story confirmed because this wise bird had lived among the cymry centuries before the normans came the owl every time blinked bowed and answered solemnly to wit to who to wit to who which in this case showed that she had learned to speak the court language why bless my soul the owl speaks good cockney english whispered one of the butlers who had been born in wales yes but that is the proper way to address his majesty king enery the eighth answered the other butler who was a native-born londoner puck and the owl returned to wales what happened after that is the a b c of history that everybody knows and for which all the welsh people to this day bless the tudors who made the welsh equal before the law with any and all englishmen even puck himself had never seen anything like the change that quickly took place for the better nor did queen mab with her wand ever work such wonders it was better than a fairy tale and the effects very soon seen were even more wonderful down went the castles into ruins for rats to run around in and wild dogs to yelp and foxes to hide in or look out of the casements Today, what were once banqueting halls are covered with moss and on the ground grass grows over which sheep graze and children play while rooks and crows nest or roost in the tall towers any englishman's life was safe anywhere and wales became one of the most easily governed countries in all the wonderful british empire and in the great world war that even children who read these stories can remember wales the land of the free the home of deathless democracy led all the british isles colonies islands or coaling stations around the wide world in loyalty valor and sacrifice 
and the handsome son of the king george the prince of wales led the descendants of welsh archers now called the fusiliers they went into battle singing old land our fathers before us held so dear or they marched following the band that played the men of harlot it is because welsh cherish their traditions harps music language and noble inheritances with which they feed their souls that they lead the four nations of the british isles in the nobler virtues that keep a nation alive as well as in the sweet humanities of the red cross and in generous hospitality to the refugee belgian true to his motto i serve the prince of wales who came to see us in nineteen nineteen as did his grandfather whom the story-teller saw when he visited our independence hall in eighteen sixty loved to be the servant of his people what was it that wrought this peaceful wonder of the sixteenth century was it a fairy spell magic ointment star-tipped wand treasures of caves or ocean depths was it anything that dragons giants ogres or even swords spears catapults or whips and clubs or elves or gnomes could do not a bit of it only justice and kindness instead of brutality and force chapter fifteen of welsh fairy tales recording by james lapine welsh fairy tales by william elliot griffiths chapter fifteen the welsh fairies hold a meeting in the ancient comic gatherings the druids poets prophets seers and singers all had a part the one most honored as the president of the meeting was crowned and garlanded then he was led in honor and sat in the chair of state they called this great occasion an eistafod or sitting after the comic word meaning a chair all over the world the welsh folk who so passionately love music poetry and their own grand language hold the eistafod at regular intervals thus they renew their love for the fatherland and what they received long ago from their ancestors now it happens that the fairies in every land usually follow the customs of the mortals among whom they live the swiss the dutch the belgian the japanese and korean fairies as we all know although they are much alike in many things are as different from each other as the countries in which they live and play so when the welch fairies hold a meeting together they resolve to have songs and harp music and to make the piper play his tunes just as in the eistafod the comic fairies of our day have had many troubles to complain of they were disgusted with so much coal smoke the poisoning of the air by chemical fumes and the blackening of the landscapes from so many factory chimneys they had other grievances also so the queen mob who had a welsh name and another fairy called puka or in english king puck send out invitations into every part of wales for a gathering on the hills near a great rock called dina's seat this is a rocky chair formed by nature they also included in their call those parts of western and south england such as are still welsh and spiritually almost a part of wales in fact cornwall was the old land in which the comrie had first landed when coming from over the sea the meeting was to be held on a moonlight night and far away from any houses lest the merrymaking dancing and singing of the fairies should keep the farmers awake this was something of which the yokels or men of the plough often complained they could not sleep while the fairies were having their parties now among the welsh fairies of every sort size dress and behavior were some good others were bad but most of them were only full of fun and mischief chief of these was a lively little fellow puck who lived in coom puka that is puck valley in breckenshire now it had been an old custom which had come down from the days of cavemen that when anyone died the people friends and relatives set up a night with a corpse the custom arose at first with the idea of protection against wild beasts and later from insult by enemies this was called a wake the watchers wept and wailed at first then fell to eating and drinking sometimes they got to be very lively the young folks even looked in on a wake after the first hour or two as fine fun 
Strong liquor was too plentiful, and it often happened that quarrels broke out. When the heads were thus fuddled, men saw or thought they saw many uncanny things like leather birds, cave eagles, and the like. But all these fantastic things and creatures, such as foolish people talk about, and with which they frighten children, such as corpse candles, demons, and imps, were ruled out and not invited to the fairy meeting. Some other objects which ignorant folks believed in were not allowed in the company. The doorkeeper was notified not to admit the eagles of darkness that live in a cave which is never lighted up, or the weird featherless bird of leather from the land of illusion and fantasy that brushes its wings against the windows when a funeral is soon to take place, or the greedy dog with silver eyes. None of these would be permitted to show themselves even if they came and tried to get in. Some other creatures not recognized in the good society of fairyland were also barred out. To this gathering only bright and lively fairies were welcome. Some of the best natured among the big creatures and especially the giants and dragons might pay a visit if they wanted to do so. But all the bad ones such as lake hags, race, sellers of liquids for wakes, who made men drunk and all who under the guise of fairies where only agents for undertakers were ruled out. The night dogs of the wicked hunter Anum, the monster Afang, Cadwallader's goats, and various cruel goblins and ogres living in ponds and that pulled cattle down to eat them up, and the immodest mermaids whose bad behavior was so well known were crossed off the list of invitations. No ugly brats such as the wicked fairies were in the habit of putting in the cradle of mortal mothers when they stole away their babies were allowed to be present, even if they should come with their mothers, this was to be a perfectly respectable company, and no bawling, squealing, crying, or blubbering was to be permitted. When they all had gathered together at the evening hour, there was seen, in the moonlight, the funniest lot of creatures that one could imagine, but all were neatly dressed and well behaved. Quite a large number of the famous fair family that moved only in the best society of fairyland, fathers, mothers, Cousins, uncles, and aunts were on hand. In fact, some of them thought it was to be awake, and were ready for whatever might turn up, whether solemn or frivolous. These were dressed in varied custom. Queen Mab, who above all else was a Welsh fairy, and whose name, as everyone knows, who talks Comric, suggested her extreme youth and lively disposition was present in all her glory. When they saw her, several learned fairies, who had come from a distance, fell at once into a conversation on this subject. One remarked, How would the queen like to add another syllable to her name? Then we should call her Mabgeth, which means kitten or little puss. Well, not so bad. However, because many mortal daddies who have a daughter call her puss, it's a term of affection with them, and little girls never seem to be offended. Oh. Suppose in talking to each other we call our queen Mabgar. What then? asked another with a roguish twinkle in the eye. It depends on how you use it, said a wise one dryly. This fairy was a stickler for the correct use of every word. If you meant babyish or childish, she or her friends might demur. But if you use the term love of children, what better name for a fairy queen? None. There could not be any they shouted all at once. But let us ask our old friend the hopper. Now such a thing as their inquiring into each other's ages was not common in fairyland. Very few ever asked such a question, for it was not thought to be polite. For though we hear of ugly brats being put in the cradles in place of pretty children, no one ever heard either of fairies being born or of dying, or of having clocks or watches, or looking to see what time it was. Nor did doctors, or the census clerks, or directory people ever trouble the fairy ladies to ask their age. Occasionally, however, there was one fairy, so wise, so learned, and so able to tell what was going to happen tomorrow or next year, that the other fairies looked up to such a one with respect and awe. Yet these honorables would hardly know what you were talking about if you asked any of them how old they might be, or spoke of old or young. If by any chance a fairy did use the word old in talking of their number, it would be for honor or dignity, and they would mean it for a compliment. 
The fact was that many of the most lively fairies showed their frivolous disposition at once. They were of the kind that, like kittens, cubs, or babies, wanted to play all the time. Yes, every moment. Already hundreds of them were tripping from flower to flower, riding on the backs of fireflies, or harnessing night moths, or any winged creature they could saddle, for a flight through the air. Or they were waltzing with glowworms, or playing ring around the rosy, or dancing in circles. They could not keep still one moment. In fact, when a great crowd of the frolicsome creatures got singing together, they made such a noise that a squad of fairy policemen, dressed in club moss and armed with pistols, was sent to warn them not to raise their voices too high, lest the farmers, especially those that were kind to the fairies, should be awakened and feel in bad humor. So the knot of learned fairies had quite a time to talk, and when able to hear their own words, the hopper, who was very learned, answered their questions about Queen Mab as follows. Well, you know the famous children's storybook in which mortals read about us, and which they say they enjoy so much, is named the Mabinogian, and that is the young folk's treasure of comic stories? It's well named, said another fairy savant, since Queen Mab is the only fairy that waits on men. She inspires their dreams when these are born in their brains. The talk now turned on Puck, who was to be the president of the meeting. They were expected to show much dignity in his presence, but some feared he would, as usual, play his pranks. Before he arrived in his chariot, which was drawn by dragonflies, some of his neighbors that lived in the valley nearby chatted about him, until the gossip became quite personal. Just for the fun of it, and the amusement of the crowd, they wanted Puck to give an exhibition, offhand of all his very varied accomplishments, for he could be all his rivals in his special variety, or as musicians say, his repertoire. No, twould be too much like a Merry Andrews or a buffoon's sideshow, where the freaks of all sorts are gathered, such as they have at those county fairs which the mortals get up, to which are gathered great crowds. The charge of remission is a sixpence. I vote no. Well, for the very reason that Puck can beat the rest of us at spells and transformations, I should like to see him do for us as many stunts as he can. I've heard from a mortal named Shakespeare that in one performance Puck could be a horse, a hound, a hog, a bear without any head, and even kindle himself into a fire, while his vocal powers, as we know, are endless. He can neigh, bark, grunt, roar, and even burn up things. Now I should like to see a fairy that could beat him at tricks. It was Puck himself who told the world that he was in the habit of doing these things, and I want to see whether he was boasting. Tut, tut, don't talk that way about our king, said a fourth fairy. All this was only chaff and fun, for the fairies were in good humor. They were only talking to fill up the interval until the music began. Now the canny Welsh fairies had learned the trick of catching farthings, pennies, and sixpences from the folk who have more curiosity in them than even fairies do. These human beings, cunning fellows that they are, let the curtain fall on a show, just at the most interesting part. Then they tell you to come the next day and find out what is to happen, or, as they say in the story paper, to be continued in our next. Or, worse than all, the storyteller stops at some very exciting episode and then passes the hat or collection box around to get the copper or silver of his listeners before he will go on. This time, however, it was Puck himself who came forward and declared that unless every one of the fairies would promise to attend the next meeting, there should be no music. Now a meeting of the Welshry, whether fairies or human, without music was a thing not to be thought of. So, Although at first some fairies grumbled and held back, and were quite sulky about it, even muttering other grumpy words, they at last all agreed, and Puck sent for the fiddler to make music for the dance. <laughs> 